Now we are recording. Before I begin, I would like to find out if I'm audible. Uh, can you people hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Today we are looking at inductive reasoning. Last week we were discussing deductive reasoning and we're saying that it is reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and conclusion is logical. And we were saying that like mathematics, the meanings of the contents of the arguments don't matter. What matters is the logical relationship. So for deductive arguments, you can have a valid argument, although the argument is not true. So whatever is the meaning of the words in the argument is not really important in determining the validity of the argument. It is either a valid modus ponens or valid modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, you know. So what matters in deductive reasoning is the logical relationship between the premises and the conclusion. If the relationship is logical, then the argument is valid, whether it is true or not, you know? Okay. For inductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and conclusion is not logical. So it is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction. We saw the example of inductive reasoning, inductive argument in the last class. 95% of all men are 95% of all men are honest. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. We said that is not the only conclusion. Peter is not honest is also a conclusion. So you can have two possible conclusions. So that's the nature of an inductive argument. Because of that, we say that it is possible to affirm the premises. The premises might be positive, the conclusion might be negative. You know. And that's because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. So for inductive argument, you need to look at the meanings of the contents and then use common sense to decide for yourself if the argument is closer to the truth, if it is close enough to the truth. You know, There's nothing like a true inductive argument. What you determine is whether an inductive argument is close enough to the truth for you to take it seriously. And that's because inductive arguments are probability arguments. Now let's look at this. Inductive arguments. The premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion, but premises do not guarantee the conclusion. Inductive arguments are probability arguments. Because inductive arguments do not depend on rules, they are harder to evaluate. So it is more difficult to evaluate inductive arguments because they don't depend on rules. Their conclusion could come out positive, negative, whichever way, you know, it, it doesn't have the certainty of deductive reasoning. So because of that, you need more homework to be able to evaluate inductive arguments. Now let's make a distinction between verifiable and confirmable statements. Verifiable statements are statements we can directly test or verify. They are usually factual or empirical statements. Example, Kofi lost strength with age. Now, this is a verifiable statement, Kofi lost strength with age. You can actually find out what Kofi was able to do in the past and what he can do now so that you know if he lost strength. Now, uh, so it's a verifiable statement because it's a factual statement but we have confirmable statements, statements that we cannot test or verify directly except through verifiable statements. Example, all men lose strength with age. So confirmable statement is different. You can't verify it directly, but you can verify, or sorry, you can confirm it by looking at verifiable statements. So verifiable statements can help you to confirm or disconfirm confirmable statements. So confirmable statements cannot be verified directly. Now they can be combined. Look at this argument. The premises are verifiable statements. The conclusion is a confirmable statement. 
So the premises, Kofi lost strength with age, Peter lost strength with age, Michael lost strength with age, and so on. But the conclusion is a confirmable statement. Therefore, all men lose strength with age. So you see that uh, this conclusion is a confirmable statement and the premises are verifiable statements. So that's how it is. That's an inductive argument. The conclusion is a confirmable statement. We also call the conclusion a hypothesis. The conclusion is also called a hypothesis. Now, inductive arguments are used mostly in sciences. So you formulate a hypothesis and then you use premises. You conduct experiments. Those experiments will generate factual statements. You describe your, the results of your experiments with factual statements. So it is those factual statements that are the premises you are seeing. And then the results of those experiments which, which you have described with factual statements will help to confirm or disconfirm your hypothesis, which is the conclusion. So inductive reasoning is used mostly in the sciences. Another example, Mary reached menopause by 40, Grace reached menopause by 35, Meredith reached menopause by 33, Rose reached menopause by 34, and so on. So there are six premises here. Three women reached menopause before or by 35, and then three of them reached menopause after 35 years. So the conclusion is therefore, half of all women will reach menopause by 35. Now, how do we detect a confirmable statement? First of all, confirmable statements are not directly testable or verified. So we've already said that. But secondly, confirmable statements can be converted into conditional statements. So any statement you can convert into a conditional statement is a confirmable statement. Now, remember that you, you cannot convert verifiable statements into, conf into conditional statements. It's only conditional as uh, confirmable statements that you can convert into conditional statements. Example, categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compelled by a coup or constitution. Translation to, uh, uh, sorry, conditional translation. If X is a leader, then X will not step down unless compared by a coup or constitution. Now let's look at this distinction between finite and infinite reference classes. We did it in our last class. We just want to recall it because we need it for our next analysis. The finite reference class is a class of countable items. Example, this copper, that man, some boys, that table, and so on. The infinite reference class is a class of uncountable items. For example, you have all metals, all men, all voters, and so on. Now, we need that analysis, that distinction here. I told you already that uh, the conclusions of inductive arguments are confirmable statements. They are also called hypotheses. Now, you, are, you have two kinds of hypotheses. You have law-like hypotheses, you have statistical hypotheses. Now, the law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. That's infinite reference class. Example, all metals expand when heated. You know. So, because it refers to all metals. So that's a law-like hypothesis. Another example, all Fs are Gs, you know. Okay. Now, law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. So G must be attributed or not attributed to every F. So if you say all Fs are Gs, then you can either attribute G to every F or don't attribute it to every F. So that's why we say law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. All men are mortal. If Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. So anything that is a man is very predictably mortal. So if you say all members of a class have a certain quality or property, then anything that is identified as a member of that class must have it. So that means it is uh, a, a, a law-like statement is highly predictive. Anything in that class must have it uh, like a law. You know, It applies whatever quality you apply to every member of a, a class, it applies to anything in that class like a law. 
That's why we call it law-like hypothesis. But if you say that only some members of a class have a certain quality, and you say something is a member of that class, so we are not sure whether it is among those that have the quality or among those that don't. So the, the predictability is less. And that is why we say that statistical hypotheses are less predictive. Now, so stat what are statistical hypotheses? Statistical hypotheses are confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100% or more than zero. Example, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, you know. Now percentage is not only, it's not the only statistical term. Other statistical terms include some, few, many, most, hardly any, and so on. So statistical hypotheses are less predictive. If X ate the food, X is likely to fall sick. Now, if you say 90% of those who ate the food fell sick and X ate the food, then X could be among the 90% who fell sick or among the 10% who did, who did not fall sick. You know, so you don't really know. But if you say 100% of those who ate the food fell sick and X ate the food, then it means that X must have fallen sick. That's why law-like hypothesis is highly predictive. But this one is less predictive than law-like hypothesis. Now let's look at confirmation versus proof. Inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. When we talk about confirmation in logic or critical thinking, it is not as powerful as confirmation the way we use it in ordinary language. You know, when we talk about confirmation ordinarily, we equate it with proof or guarantee, you know, but in logic, confirmation is not as powerful as that. Inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof. Confirmation is not proof. Now I forgot. So uh, let me say that another name for deductive arguments is deductive proofs. A deductive argument is also called a deductive proof, you know, because it has the accuracy of, uh, uh, you know, a mathematical calculation. So we call it a deductive proof. So confirmation is not proof. And then another problem is that evidence, physical evidence has some limitations. Now, ordinarily we know, we think that evidence is the highest form of proof, you know, but in science, we'll see that evidence also has some limitations. Now let's, we'll see that as we go on. Now let's look at two major ways to detect inductive arguments. Now, so how do you detect uh, inductive arguments? There are two ways. First of all, they are capable of more than one conclusion. So we said that already. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. Ama ate the food. So there are two conclusions. Ama fell sick, Ama did not fall sick. Because Ama could be among the 90% who, who fell sick or among the 10% who didn't fall sick. So inductive arguments are always generating more than one conclusion. But the second way of detecting inductive arguments is that inductive arguments are extrapolations. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. So you see an argument and then you smuggle an information into the conclusion, which is not in any of the premises or all the premises put together. So all inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted for in the premises. Now, this is the technicality. A known thing, A, has certain properties such as X, Y, and Z. Another thing, B, that is not in the premises has the same properties, X, Y, and Z. Now, A also has an additional property, Q. Now, on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes in reality extrapolates that B also has the additional property, Q. You know, so you know that A and B have three identical properties, X, Y, and Z. Now, you notice that A also has another property, Q but you don't know whether B has it. Now you say because they have three identical properties, X, Y, and Z, B might also have Q. But that argument is not strong enough because A could have Q and B doesn't have it. The fact that they have three similar properties doesn't mean that every other property they have will be similar. 
So the idea of induction then is that if B is like A in some respects, it may also be like A in other respects. So that's the weakness of induction, inductive arguments. Now I said inductive arguments are extrapolations. So now let me tell you about the directions of extrapolation. Now, this one is not in your textbook, but I took it in the uh, critical thinking textbook that is sold at the university bookshop. You know, so I, I got it from that book so that, you know, uh, you will see, uh, you'll be able to recognize every form of inductive argument. Now, in directions of extrapolation, you have part whole extrapolations, attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part of parts. We have two kinds of part whole extrapolations. We have generalizations and we have statistical syllogisms. Now for generalization, Peter is strong, James is strong, all men are strong. So this argument you know, concludes that all men are strong because two men are strong. You know it is not a good argument. It's not a strong enough argument. It's, it's called a generalization. Then we have statistical syllogisms. Most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a Canadian university student, therefore Caroline drinks alcohol. You know the argument is not entirely correct. It's only partially correct. There are actually two conclusions. The second conclusion is missing. The second conclusion is that Caroline doesn't drink alcohol because Caroline could be among the few who don't drink alcohol. So there's, this argument is not as accurate as an inductive argument, as a deductive argument. Then we have analogies, arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. You know, we saw that just now, we, it is called analogies. Example, the structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. So this argument is basing on the fact that all these countries have a common quality of third world countries and, and then concludes that anything that works in one of these countries will work in the other one simply because they are third world countries. So this is an, an argument by analogy, moving from the fact of a common quality to say that there will be other common qualities. But that is not a guaranteed argument. The argument is not really a very strong one. Then we have predictions. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Therefore, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. You know, the point is that the future is not the same as the past. So winning 30 boxing fights doesn't necessarily mean you win the next one. So that's why it's an inductive argument. You can say Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Tyson will not win his next boxing fight. So it, it, the, the, the argument generates more than one conclusion. So this is a prediction. So these are the different kinds of inductive arguments in, in terms of the direction of extrapolation. You can either extrapolate from a part to a whole or from one property to a similar property or from the past to the future. These are the directions of extrapolation. Now let's look at two kinds of inductive arguments based on their strength. One is stronger than the other. Enumerative arguments, two kinds of enumerative inductive arguments. Now an enumerative argument is an argument with many premises. That is enumerating the premises like a list. Now the first kind of inductive argument is the one with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. Then the second type is the one with um, statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Now let's look at the, the inductive argument to the law-like hypothesis as conclusion. Now this is an example. This is an experiment of expanding uh, heating metals to see whether they will expand. Gold expanded when heated, silver expanded when heated, bronze expanded when heated, 
copper expanded when heated and so on. So 10 different metals expanded when heated. And then the summary premise is that all the metals tested so far expanded when heated. And then the conclusion is all metals expand when heated. Now you can see there's a, serious, there's a basic difference between the premises and conclusion. The premises are particular statements. The conclusion is a general statement. The premises are talking about specific metals and then the conclusion is talking about all metals. Even the summary premise is talking about all the metals tested, which is countable. But the conclusion is talking about all metals, which is not countable. Now the problem is that you can't reach a conclusion about all metals, which is uncountable from all the metals tested so far, which is countable. Or you can't reach a conclusion about all metals from 10 metals. Now all metals include metals that we've not even discovered. Metals that are still in the ground, which we don't know. You know. So there's a jumping from particular statements to general statement. That jump is somehow fallacious. And you can see that there's an information in the conclusion that is not contained in any of the premises or even all the premises put together. That information is information about all metals. Now there's nothing in the premises that will give you any idea about all metals. Now this is the technicality. Premises one to 10 are verifiable particular statements. The summary premise is a summation of all the verifiable premises. The conclusion is a confirmable or general statement. Now the argument is strictly invalid because it, it involves jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. That's the reason why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. Now the conclusion is in fact false because as it turns out, it was later discovered that some metals in fact do not expand when heated. They are called superconductors. They don't absorb heat, so they don't expand. So the conclusion is false and all the premises are true. And that is why it is possible to deny the conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. And this is applicable to all the types of extrapolation, path hole, analogies, predictions, and so on. Now let's look at the second kind of uh, inductive argument. The second, the second type of inductive arguments, arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Now this is an example. Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Now this example is about vaccinating 10 people for polio and then observing the result. Now after 10 people were vaccinated, Eight people did not suffer polio again, but two people suffered polio even after they were vaccinated. Now, so these are the premises, eight premises, or sorry, 10 premises. Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. Mary was vaccinated and never suffered. Stanley was vaccinated and never suffered. James was vaccinated and never suffered. Bob was vaccinated and suffered it. Jill never suffered. Samuel never suffered. John never suffered. Carol never suffered it. So the summary premise is that eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated for polio did not suffer polio. And then the conclusion, is that polio vaccination is, has 80% potential of preventing polio. Now remember that eight out of 10 people is 80%. So that's why the conclusion is that way. Now, so the conclusion is a statistical hypothesis. So this is an argument with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. This kind of argument is safer to make compared to the argument with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. When you will say all metals expand when heated, it is, it is difficult to defend it. But when you say 80% of this did this, it's, it's easier to defend because you have the data, you have the proof, you have the evidence, you know, we we'll, won't we'll call it proof anyway, but we'll call it evidence. 
Now, so we have two types of inductive arguments, the ones ending with law-like hypotheses as conclusions and the ones ending with statistical hypotheses as conclusions. Now the hypothesis, hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments because they are confirmable statements to be supported, confirmed or denied by verifiable statements. Okay, so now let's go and look at, um, we are done looking at inductive arguments. Now I want us to make some comparison between deductive and inductive arguments. Now, by now it is already clear to you that deductive arguments are accurate, and induct but inductive arguments are not ac accurate. But what you may not know is that deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the ability to provide information. For example, either it is raining or it is not raining. Now, this is a disjunctive statement. Either it is raining or it is not raining. This, uh, this, this statement is accurate and it, is, it will always be accurate. If it is raining, it is accurate. If it is not raining, it is accurate. So whether it is raining or not, the statement is accurate. But does it provide you with information about whether it is raining? It doesn't. You know, so that's why we say deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of being able to provide information. The same goes for statement two. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. Now that's a conditional statement. It, that, that statement is always accurate. If it is raining, someone will get wet. That's correct. If it is raining, someone will get wet. So the statement is accurate if it is raining. If it is not raining, someone will not get wet. So the statement is also correct if it is not raining. So whether it is raining or not, the statement is correct. But does it tell you, does it give you any information about whether it is raining? It doesn't. So it is accurate at the expense of being able to provide you with information. On the other hand, inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So it is the other way around for inductive arguments. Now, when you provide information, the information you've provided is falsifiable, is falsifiable. The information you've provided is capable of being true or false. That's why we say it is falsifiable or it is capable of being false. Now, example, it is raining right now. Now, right now, it is not raining around me, around my place or my house. So for me, the statement is false. It is raining right now. And if it is not raining where you are right now, then the statement is also false for you. So that's why we said any information is falsifiable, especially empirical information. falsifiability and science. Any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. The more valuable the empirical information, the more falsifiable. Look at this empirical statement. It rains every third Friday of the month. It is more valuable information than it rained just now. Now look at the two. How do you determine the value of information, empirical information? You determine the value of empirical information by, by asking yourself what you can do with it, finding out what you can do, what you can use it to do. Okay, if you are a farmer and you are told that it rained just now, you can decide that tomorrow morning you you go to your farm and till the soil because the soil will be wet and soft. So that information was, was you know, you, you, it was valuable to you. But if you are told that it rains every third Friday of the moon, that means you know that every third Saturday of the moon, you go early in the morning to your farm and till the soil. So that means that the first statement is more valuable to you compared to the second one. But the more valuable, the more falsifiable. So the first one is more falsifiable than the second one. It takes only one third Friday of not raining to falsify the first statement. You know, so the, the, the more valuable the information, the more falsifiable it is. Okay, so this is the end of the class. We shall do causal reasoning next week. And um, I would encourage you to watch your videos regularly.
watch different videos on each topic to gain multiple perspectives. I mean, read your textbooks, do all the exercises in your textbooks. So now I'm going to take some questions. Anyone who has questions to ask, please ask so that I will address your questions and then I will end the class and upload this video to your Sakai immediately so that all those who couldn't uh, attend this class can watch it even this evening. So does anyone have any questions to ask? If you have questions to ask, just raise your hand and then I'll ask you to speak up. And then after that, to we'll call it a day and then the video will go to your Sakai. Okay, so since no one has any question, we're going to call it a day. We shall be meeting again at the same time on Saturday. So Saturday we meet by four o'clock and we'll start causal reasoning. So until then, please keep working hard. I encourage you to do your best as a student so that you'll be great in the future. All right, bye-bye.